Income tax 2023-2024. Itemized deductions, interest you paid. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking to get the tax man off our back with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in the instructions for Schedule A tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on what I would call the the below-the-line deductions, more specifically, the itemized deductions. Remembering the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Remembering that for taxes, deductions are good. Therefore, we look for more of them. The difference between the types of deductions include the above the line deductions or adjustments to income do not have to clear a threshold such as the standard deduction before we get a benefit from them. Whereas the itemized deductions do typically have to increase higher than the threshold of the standard deduction before we get a benefit from them. Looking at the first page of the form 1040 focused on line number 12, the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deduction, noting that the standard deduction is tied heavily to the filing status in determining the value of that standard deduction, which we would need to clear to take the itemized deduction. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. If we were itemizing, then we would be attaching the Schedule A typically, the Schedule A being the itemized deductions worksheet, the major categories on the left-hand side, although this is not the entire schedule here. This is the standard deductions that we would need to be clearing, noting that the standard deduction, again, is tied heavily to filing status. Single filers, 13850 Married filing joint, 27700 In the middle, head of household, 12800 If they are over a certain age, and or blind, we can then have single filing statuses. If one or two of those items apply, here's the standard deduction increases, married filing joint. You can have one through four of those items considering we have two people and the corresponding standard deductions, which we would have to clear in order to get a benefit from the itemized deductions typically. All right, now we're talking about interest paid, remembering once again that when we talk about the federal income taxes or any income tax, you would think it'd be most normal for an income tax to have deductions that you needed to expend in order to generate the revenue, which we can most clearly see on a Schedule C where we have an income statement, income minus expenses, which are business deductions, were taxed on the net income. Normally, if you're a W-2 employee, you don't have any expenses because the idea is that the employer is paying for the expenses. Therefore, you just have the W-2 income. The Schedule A, on the other hand, is full of a bunch of items that don't correspond to the standard deductions you would think natural to an income tax system if it was just designed to collect money to protect us with the military and whatnot and not to nudge us and manipulate us in all other kinds of way because all the stuff on the itemized deductions on the Schedule A or many of them are personal types of deductions which we get to deduct for one reason uh, or another. 
which could add to some complications in terms of what's going to be the qualifying factor that allows us to take the deduction and when the deductions on the Schedule A that were personal in nature but now deductible also kind of collide with the natural types of deductions such as business deductions, how are we going to deal with basically splitting the capacity to deduct between those per two particular areas in a way that we don't basically double dip is the general idea. Now, when you hear interest paid, the first thing that should come to your mind is mortgage interest and the mortgage interest because that's usually the big line item that pushes people over from the standard deduction uh, to the itemized deduction. So if you're trying to determine if someone is itemizing, you can look at their prior year tax return, that helps. But you can also say, hey, do you own a home? If they do, you can almost assume, given home prices, that they have a loan on it. And if they have a loan on it, they're paying mortgage interest. And the mortgage interest is a big one that possibly could be significantly adding to the itemized deductions. If you compile that or combine it with the property taxes, which will certainly be there as well, although varies greatly depending on location where you're at then those are the things that often kick people over uh, for the interest. Okay, so the rules for deducting interest vary depending on whether the loan proceeds are used for business, personal, or investment activities. So if you looked at this just from like, if you're like just saying, hey, I have an income tax, what's the kind of loan that you would expect would be deductible? You would expect the loan for business to be deductible. If you took out a business loan, for example, and you bought stuff, that you're going to use to generate revenue such as a sole proprietorship then you don't get to deduct the principal payments on the loan like the mortgage payments that people make the actual payments but the renting of the money the renting of the purchasing power uh, which is called interest possibly could be deductible so if it was a business expense that seems kind of natural you needed that money in order to generate the revenue therefore the expense on it would be deductible naturally for a uh, for a federal for an income tax system personal interest usually you would think not right and this would be things like if you used your credit card for example to go on a shopping spree for personal clothes that you don't even wear or something like that, you know, right right or just to a restaurant whatever it is uh i'm not trying to pick on people with their who wear whatever whatever you buy personally if it's a personal expense, you would think it wouldn't normally be deductible. If you financed the personal expense with a loan, uh, if you took out a loan to go on a vacation to Hawaii or something, and it's totally personal, you would think the interest on the loan uh, would not be deductible because it's it would be personal. That's the general rule. The big exception to that is, of course, the mortgage interest, in which case you're buying a home and the home is typically personal, but possibly deductible, possibly because in part, you've got big lobbyists in the, in the home building and selling and real estate area that want to subsidize the market, I would think is might be one reason uh, it's there. But anyway, that's somewhat skeptical of a, or investment activities. Now investments kind of in the middle, because if you think about investment activities, you, you're basically thinking of a situation where you might take out a loan in order to buy, say, stocks and bonds because you think the stocks and bonds are going to go up in value, for example. So if you think like Apple stock is going to go up in value, I need to buy Apple stock because it's going to double in value tomorrow, but I don't have any money. Well, what I can do is leverage it, right? I could take out a loan and then purchase the stocks and then we'll see what happens, right? If it goes up in value, I still have to pay off the loan payments, but as long as the increase in value is greater than the amount of the interest uh, that I have to pay, then I'm a winner in that game. And that works great as long as you're winning. <laughs> but, but if the stock goes down in value, you can also get in the hole real quickly. So there, there's a, a real question in terms of just should we have it deductible or not in terms of basically investment and, and like speculative purposes? Because the question there is, do we want to be incentivizing people to taking on risks that seem more closer akin to like gambling rather than legitimate long-term business uh, risk, 
which would be more like the situation where you buy equipment and you're planning on building a business, which is a long-term thing rather than a short-term investment gain that you might be trying to take out a loan because you heard some, you know, it's got some inside news on a stock trade or something like that. So those, those are the general things. So see, you can see publication 535 for more information about deducting business interest expenses. All right, so see publication 550 for more information about deducting investment interest expenses. You can't deduct personal interest. So the credit card, not typically included. You can't typically deduct, a, if you got a car loan or something like that, you can't typically deduct uh, the car loan. What about uh, student loans? Again, it's personal. You don't deduct it here, but maybe you could deduct it somewhere, right? It might be an above the line uh, type of deduction. That's another kind of exception to the general rule. Why? Most likely because the schools have a big lobbying industry, <laughs> right? For the universities, which jacked up the, the cost of education. Was that actually beneficial in the long run to people? I don't know, because I think the cost of education would be a whole lot cheaper if they didn't do that and it would be easier to know what's happening, but that's how it is. So however, you can deduct the qualified home mortgage interest. So that's the big one that it used to be before, by the way, a long time ago, they had more interest that was deductible, like even like credit card interest and whatnot. And once something is deductible, you'll note that it's very hard to remove it. Like I feel bad for people that have large student loans that feel like they're tied to like a political parties, for example, who are promising to relieve the loan because they, they basically, that's what they bet on, right? That's what they, 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 their action was based on the tax code. The tax code incentivized their action. And now it's almost like you've accepted money from the state and now the state's got you locked in, like happens to some people when we're on like welfare or something like that. It's hard to get off sometimes because, because then you'll you'll lose it right it's hard to, then they pull the rug out from under you so that's the problem with the tax code once a deduction is in place it's hard to take it out because people have already made long-term plans on it and that's why the tax code seems to move along kind of like a zombie and you can't basically simplify it uh, and so that's also why we need to be very careful when we make more and further complications to the tax code, which people put long-term plans on, such as investments in education, investments in homes, and, and all that kind of stuff, because you can't, you can't just change it if it doesn't work out. It's not something you can tinker with, but okay. So then we have the, however, you can deduct qualified home mortgage interest on your schedule A and interest on certain student loans. That's on schedule one. We talked about it before on schedule one. Remember that schedule one is not an itemized deduction. So you might get a benefit of being able to deduct things on schedule one, such as the student loan interest, even if you're not itemizing. So form 1040 line 21, you can see more information on that in publication 936 and publication 970. So if you use proceeds of a loan for more than one purpose, for example, personal and business, you must allocate the interest on the loan to each use. Now, again, because we are now deducting personal things on the Schedule A, this type of thing will happen more often in that we might be able to qualify for the same cost the same expense in different areas. For example, if we used part of our home, not simply for personal use, but for the business, we have a home office in it. If we have a home office in it, then the mortgage that we paid for the home, which we're using in part for our business, you would think would be deductible because that would be similar to me basically getting a separate building that was my business and I, I own it and I'm paying interest on the loan that I got for my office building or something like that, you would think that would be deductible because it would be business related. However, if it's with regards to your home, that means only part of your home is going to be deductible on the Schedule C, which is typically more beneficial than deducting on the Schedule A because you don't have any limitation. You don't have that cap of clearing the standard deduction to be able to deduct on the Schedule C. So what are you gonna do? Because you, you get only one interest 1098 form, you're gonna to have to use some kind of percentage allocation, allocating between Schedule C and Schedule A. What you can't do is report the whole, the amount on Schedule C and then double dip 
recording the same amount on Schedule A. In other words, if you had $10,000 of mortgage interest on the home and you're able, you're going to have, you can only deduct 10,000, where is it going to be? Some ratio of it will have to go to Schedule A, like 2,000 of it or whatever, and the rest go to, to uh, I'm sorry, to the Schedule C, 2,000, and then 8,000 on Schedule A or something like that. And you might use some allocation method such as the square footage of the home versus the office square footage, which we'll talk about when we get to a Schedule C type of business. So uh, you allocate interest on a loan in the same way as the loan is allocated. You do this by tracing disbursements of the debt proceeds to specific uses. For more information on allocating interest, you can see publication 535. So you allocate interest on the loan the same way as the loan is allocated. In other words, you we're determining that the home mortgage loan is something that is deductible, whereas, whereas a loan for other purposes is not. So then the question is, well, what if I took a $10,000 loan out? How do I know what it was used for, right? Because, I mean, I could have just got a loan and put collateral on it. And then I went on vacation. I got $10,000 loan. I went on vacation. How, how do I know where it should be allocated for? Or I might have put the home as collateral on the loan. So now it's the, the, the home is collateral for the loan, but I used the money to buy a car or something like that rather than basically increase the value of the home or something like that. Well, then you, so that can get kind of confusing because on the bank side of things, the bank isn't really concerned about whether it's deductible or not. The bank is concerned with whether you're going to be able to pay back the loan. So what they're looking for is collateral on the loan in the event that you default on the loan. But what we need for taxes is to know what the proper allocation of the loan was for so we can determine that the rent on the purchasing power of the money if it's deductible or not, and if deductible, where? On Schedule C, on Schedule A, possibly not deductible at all. And so that's the question. In general, if you paid interest in 2023 that applies to any period after 2023, you can deduct only amounts apply, that apply to for 2023. Okay, so this is another complication that, remember that the income tax code for individual taxes is typically a cash-based system. You get the deduction, in other words, when you pay it, which is simple. It's easy to audit. It's easy to track. However, also easy to manipulate, which is why when we talk about like businesses, they're required to use an accrual system and they're held to that accrual system with an audit, right? That's what we do for corporations. We can't basically have an audit of every individual's taxes. Therefore, we want to keep it simple, cash-based system, and then the IRS might randomly audit people, which they can then follow the money fairly easily. However, people will come up with plans then to distort when they're going to try to get the deduction, meaning I would rather have the deduction sooner rather than later in general, and some years I might have more income than other years, which because of the progressive tax system will result in higher tax rates. So if in this year I have a higher tax rate than I think I'm going to have next year because I earned more money, I might be looking for more deductions this year. One of the bright ideas I might come up with is that, hey, look, why don't I just say to my mortgage company, I'm going to pay you all of the interest on the loan up front. And then I'm going to pay the principal later. Is that okay? Well, it would be okay with the bank if they were if they were allowed to do that, maybe, because that might mean they get an upfront payment sooner. But the IRS is going to say, no, you can't do that. You can't, you can't just, you can't just, that would be like prepaying the rent. Like if you're going to prepay the rent on your office building for the next 10 years, and I paid it today, and I got to deduct the whole thing today, because I paid it today. Well, you can't really do that because you're, you didn't use the office building. So now the IRS is gonna have to kind of limit that from happening and say, well, you can't, you can't do this whole prepayment thing to try to distort and take the deduction earlier than you otherwise would. All right, use Schedule A to deduct qualified home mortgage interest and investment interest. 
So we'll talk a little bit more specifically on some of those categories in a future presentation.